Um, and uh, yeah, um, we're really excited to have Dennis Anthony from the from the reading group himself. Uh, who's currently a GNC engineer at Raytheon uh, and got his MS in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton, co-advised by Jaime Dizak and uh, Andrea Goldsmith. And if I mispronounced either of their names, I'm quite sorry. Um, and he received his BS in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas at Austin, and he's presenting some work uh, from a recent ICRA uh, paper. So yeah, if you want to take over from there, uh, we're psyched to have you. Absolutely. No, psyched to be here. So uh, yeah, hello, everybody. My name is Dennis, and uh, today I'll be talking about some of the work that was uh, recently presented at uh, this year's ICRA um, on this paper called Back to the Future, Efficient Time Consistent Solutions in Reach Boy Games. Uh, with my collaborators, uh, Dewey Nguyen, uh, David Fridovich Cairo, who some of you may know, he's recently graduated from Berkeley, and uh, Jaime uh, Fizak, uh, who whose last name sometimes I don't know how to pronounce, so uh, don't feel bad. Um, okay, yeah, so let's jump into it. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'll start off with some motivation as, uh, as to why we kind of care about, uh, or kind of start off with some motivation that'll kind of lead into uh, the question we'll be asking at hand. Um, so, you know, let's say that, um, you know, you wake up early in the morning, you know, you had a late night last night, you wake up early in the morning, uh, but, you know, you may be late for class, you may be late for work, uh, what have you. Uh, so, you know, you do your daily morning routines and, uh, you know, you hop in the car, but since you're kind of running late, you know, you may, uh, put the pedal to the metal just a little bit more and, uh, you know, you may get on a road and you may get behind a grandma or a grandpa who's driving uh, 15 miles per hour in like a 45 mile per hour lane, right? But you know, you're really in a rush and you're really trying to get to your destination. So one thing that you may do is uh, you may try to bypass the uh, vehicle that's in front of you. So you wanna reach a destination in front of this vehicle, but you also wanna beware of uh, oncoming vehicles because you, know, you also wanna avoid collision. Um, Kind of similar situation with uh, with this. Um, I recently had this to uh, happen to me, so I, I thought I'd be, I thought it'd be interesting to put in the presentation. So, you know, when you're in a new city or a new state, uh, you know, sometimes you're. I mean, well, you know, you may not be familiar with the roads, and you know, sometimes when the when the line disappears between both lanes, you're not really sure if this is a lane that I can use or if this is oncoming vehicles. And when you're not sure, then you know. Uh, and when you find out it's oncoming vehicles lane, then you know sometimes you may have to hit your brakes really hard if somebody's uh, you know in that lane. Uh, so that's uh, another case scenario. And you know, last but not least, uh, is drone racing, right? So you know, the main objective in drone racing is that you know you want your drone to finish first. Uh, you want it to reach its final destination, but you also want it to finish first. But you know, throughout this process, you uh, you you know don't want to collide with uh, other drones that's in a race, and you also don't want to collide with uh, the hoops or you know obstacles that are also in the race. Um, so all three of these kind of uh, situations kind of have something in common. There's many, many more situations. I'll just talk about these three, but the uh, commonality between all three is that uh, you have multiple uh, agents interacting. Uh, in an environment, not cooperatively, and you know each agent has a target it wants to satisfy, and then has uh, very conditions that it would like to avoid. And you know, there's certain tools out there for you know uh, satisfying a target condition while uh, avoiding failure conditions. But uh, the one I'll talk about today is uh, dynamic games, and then I'll kind of talk about the ideas that we kind of built off of uh, uh, recently published uh, work. But um, so the flow down of this work uh, that I'll be talking about today is so I'll give you know a bit more background into you know dynamic games and then I'll give a brief overview of reachability games and then um, after that I'll talk about these ideas of reachable games and this idea of time consistency um, and then once we kind of have these ideas down then I'll kind of show a single player case a two player case but in a defensive driving scenario and then last but not least I'll show a three player case between two vehicles. So, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, this is uh, at least somewhat realistic, at least for me, whenever I was uh, standing in New Jersey, where the crowd, uh, where the roads are really flooded with uh, uh, motorcycles or cars, or, you know, maybe even poor pedestrians that may try to cross the road. Um, 
So really here, what I'm trying to say is that we have, you know, lots of different agents act interacting all in the same environment. And, uh, you know, each one of these agents knows, you know, what's it, what it wants to do, whether it be, you know, bypass grandma that we, you know, talked about in the last slide, or whether it be slow down, speed up, uh, switch lanes. But um, the thing about this is, is that some of these uh, objectives may conflict. If I'm in the right lane and I want to, if I'm like next to you in the right lane and I want to switch lanes to the left lane and you're in the left lane and want to switch to right lane, some of these objectives may conflict. We want to, you know, uh, do this, uh, but, you know, carefully. Um, but one tool that's kind of uh, been interesting to me and uh, there's been some really interesting work that's been uh, done and published within the last past, you know, at least, you know, a few years or so is uh, Dynamic Games. And Dynamic Games is really just a beautiful mathematical tool that kind of describes uh, what um, behavior looks like in uh, these sorts of settings um, that, you know, occur over time. And um, so, yeah, so, you know, I'll give a little bit more background to Dynamic Games. So, you know, how I like to think about this is that Dynamic Games has three main ingredients. Um, the first ingredient is our dynamics, right? Because dynamic games. And this just uh, tells us how we, uh, how our system evolves over time. So this is just a, uh, a generic uh, x of t plus one is a function of uh, x of t and u sub t uh, from one to n, where uh, t is our time, x of t is our state at time t, and then um, n is the number of players that we have in this game. Um, our next ingredient is our objective. And this just really asks the question, uh, what do the players want? Um, usually it's written in uh, this form here where we have J of X and U, uh, where in this case, uh, X is our trajectory and U is our control history for uh, player I. And uh, last but certainly not least, I would say this is probably the most important ingredient is our information structure. And this just asks the question, you know, what do the players want? Um, and this is just asking really, okay, our control uh, for player I at time step T is a function of what? And if it's open loop, uh, then it just knows the, the state at, uh, or it just knows the initial state, or each player only knows the initial state. Um, or we could have a feedback structure where um, our control is dependent on the, the state at um, time step T. So each player kind of knows uh, the state at, um, at each time. And you know, there's many different equilibria that can be found, uh, but for uh, this work I'll be talking about today, we'll be one to talk for feedback Nash, where I'm sure people are familiar with uh, Nash equilibrium, but all it's just saying is that uh, no player has the uh, incentive to unilaterally deviate from its uh, current strategy. Okay. So um, with this uh, reach void LQ, uh, with this time consistent reach void LQ solver that I'll be discussing later on in this talk, uh, these ideas are really built off of uh, something uh, that's called iterative linear quadri uh, quadratic games, um, or IOQ games for short. Um, and I kind of like to think about this as a um, multi-agent extension of IOQR, where IOQR is just for the single player case, IOQ games is kind of extensive for multiple player case. Um, so here, um, so, you know, I'm sure as we all know, global equilibria uh, are really hard for to find even in different games. Uh, so one thing that was done in this work is uh, solving for a local uh, approximation for uh, um, Nash equilibrium. And uh, the flow down of this algorithm is very simple. So we have uh, initial strategy. And so we input into our dynamics, roll it out. We get, uh, we get a trajectory, or we get our trajectory. And then with this trajectory, what we do is we linearize our dynamics and we do a second order Taylor expansion on our cost. Um, once we have this, we uh, solve for the feedback in P4 terms. Um, then once we have feedback in P4 terms, we update our strategy, and then we can input the strategy into our dynamics, roll it out, and get an updated tra uh, trajectory. And then, you know, we just repeat this process until convergence, until we find a, a local Nash uh, uh, equilibrium. So that's pretty much the main idea of uh, IOP games, and the ideas I'll be talking about today is kind of based off of this uh, structure. Okay, um, so I'll kind of just give a quick brief overview of reachability games. Uh, so, uh, so as I'm sure we all know, you know, optimal control problems, uh, you know, all over the place. But um, 
But when it comes to optimal control problems, they're usually written in a time additive uh, uh, cost structure. Um, but the thing is, is that um, for certain situations, uh, a time additive cost structure may not be the most beneficial. Um, so I have like this little toy example here at the bottom where the red circle is an obstacle. We have our vehicle. And then the main objective of this vehicle is just to avoid the obstacle. Um, so using uh, just using a time additive cost structure, we may uh, we may get out a uh, trajectory that looks something like this, uh, where in this case, this may indicate, okay, the average cost is less than zero. So this must imply that it's safe, right? But obviously if the vehicle follows this uh, trajectory, then it clearly runs into the obstacle. Um, so another cost structure that may be more beneficial to use in this case, uh, that'll give us a trajectory that may, that may look something like this is a max over time cost structure. Um, where in this case, you know, if uh, our car total cost comes out less than zero, then uh, this implies it's safe. And if our vehicle follows this trajectory, then we see that it avoids the obstacle while, uh, uh, yeah, it avoids the obstacle. So, a uh, big takeaway just from this slide is that time additive cost structure may not be beneficial in all situations. And for when I say reachability, I could mean avoidance games, or I could mean like uh, reachability games, as in like uh, reach of the target. So I kind of use those interchangeably. But in this case, it's technically an avoidance game. But um, you know, in case scenarios like this, a, you know, a max over time cost structure may be more beneficial. Um, okay. So. Uh, going back to the three main ingredients with this avoidance game idea that I'm that I just talked about in the last slide. Uh, so uh, even for this uh, toy example, but even for when I get to the uh, one player, two player, and three player case for our dynamics, what we'll be using is uh, bicycle dynamics. So um, which is written in this form um, for our objective. Uh, what did what do the players want? So in this one player case that I just described, the player just wants to avoid. Uh, Collision with the obstacle, so we can rewrite this J in the form of max of G, where in this case G is our distance to collision. Um, and last but not least is our information structure, which uh, since the ideas that I'll be talking about today is built off of IOC games and IOC games kind of searches for a uh, feedback Nash equilibrium, then we'll also be uh, searching for a feedback Nash equilibrium. So uh, the control is a function of our state at each uh, at each time T. Okay. Um, so I'll kind of quickly go over this. Uh, so with IOP games, IOP games uses a sum over time cost structure, but even for like um, reachability only or avoidance only games, uh, it's not necessarily a uh, sum over time cost structure. It's more of a, you, uh, you go through uh, your planet horizon and you pick the time at which the max cost uh, occurs. And we call this critical, well, I call this critical time uh, T star. And when we do our second order Taylor expansion, then we get a form that looks something like this, where uh, X bar is our state trajectory, H is our state variation, um, lowercase q is our gradient of our cost function and uh capital q is our hessian of our cost uh, function so just quickly wanted to uh store that out there um also too uh there's something you know we want to keep in mind and it's this idea of relaxation right so um with um with these lq games uh we want to make sure that they're well defined um but even for the toy example I was talking about with the avoidance game, uh, the avoidance game is really only a function of our state, right? Because the the cost function is just the distance to collision. So where the distance between where we are and our obstacle. Um, so, you know, I say this to say that it's not really control uh, dependent, but uh, when it comes to analytical NAS solutions to LQ games, there has to be some sort of uh, control uh, dependency. And the way that we kind of, I had control dependency into these uh, into these problems is uh, we just we still have our max of G and then uh, then we do plus one half times uh, this parameter epsilon times the uh, times the summation of uh, the two norm squared of our controls and really this epsilon is just saying okay hey if epsilon is small then we don't really care much about uh, our control efforts best we kind of crank up the knob and you know uh make this parameter larger and larger then it's saying 
okay, hey, I actually care more and more about our control. Um, and yeah, just a picture to the right, I took this from I think one of David's papers. Uh, so he just kind of showed a, uh, a simple demonstration of, okay, as you crank out, crank up epsilon, then what does the traje trajectory of each player look like? So we can kind of see that when it's small, it's blue trajectories, but as you kind of crank it up, then, you know, the player's um, optimal trajectories start to differ uh, a bit. Um, okay. Okay, so now I kind of I'll talk about uh, some reach void games, and then I'll uh, discuss this uh, idea that of uh, uh, time consistency. Um, so, yeah, so reach void decision problems uh, appear in a wide range of engineering domains. Um, whenever a system is required to reach a desired state while maintaining acceptable conditions at all times, and for a uh, general dynamical system, we can formalize the reach void requirement through a temporal logic specification. And all this is saying is that at some uh, time within our planet horizon, the state, our, the state must be inside the desired target set. And until then, it must have stayed clear of the uh, designated value set. Okay. And usually to solve reach void games, it's common to encode the target and value set using uh, margin functions whose sign indicates whether the state is inside the corresponding set. And by doing this, uh, this allows us to define a continuous reach void cost to go objective which is less than or equal to zero if and only if the evaluated trajectory subsequently uh, reaches the target uh, without first entering the failure set. Okay. Uh, and um, so this formalization can be used to describe even, you know, I've talked about single player case, but this formalization can be used to describe uh, uh, the multiplayer case. So here uh, I have a lane changing game where player one, which is the white car, uh, wishes to change lane. Uh, Without colliding with player two, uh, which is the uh, which is the gray car, um, and in contrast, you know, player two also wishes to avoid collision with player one uh, while continuing to make progress in its current lane. And so, really, what I'm getting at here is that uh, the control actions of each player affects the others' as failure set, uh, resulting in a decision problem that is uh, that is could be really difficult to solve. Uh, so recent work um, finds efficient local solutions to the reachability only case by solving repeated LQ uh, approximations to the original problems. And these approximations are formed by first uh, extracting the time at which the target margin function reaches its minimum, then uh, quadratizing or doing a second order table expansion of the target margin function and uh, yeah, and then solving the problem. So, um, so yeah, repeatedly solving these LQ games uh, converges to a uh, local equilibrium. Um, and in this case here, uh, I know I have R min of L. Uh, this, is, this is the actual reachability case, whereas the example I showed earlier is like the avoidance game case. Um, but still both uh, uh, same ideas. Um, but the thing here is that, um, so we have this critical time T star, I'll kind of be using throughout the talk, uh, critical time, pinch point, really all this is saying is that uh, the, the cost that we incur um, is, uh, um, is defined by this critical time, uh, T star or pinch point T star. Um, but, you know, using these uh, pinch point methods, uh, these pinch point methods actually lack an important property, which is this idea of time consistency, which I'll, uh, which I'll get to in uh, later slides. Um, okay, so I'll kind of hand wavy, hand wavingly kind of uh, discuss the uh, pinch point versus time consistent uh, methods, and then we'll actually jump into a little bit of detail about. So, you know, let's say that you know we're on this road and we have uh, cars uh, parked to the side, but one of the cars may be uh, this planet. Um, so, you know, we pull up. Um, and, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, we want to get to points, you know, uh, after this slanted car. So we could have uh, two targets that could be here. Um, but let's say that we have some initial strategy that will just have us drive forward um, as such. But, you know, as we can kind of see, you know, these this uh, trajectory may not be the best to take because if we do, then our vehicle collides with uh, the slanted car or the car that's at an angle, which is no good. So uh, one thing that we 
could do is kind of use this idea of like pinch point, um, which I'll discuss uh, in the next slides. Um, but if we use this idea of pinch points where we kind of only care about, you know, one critical time when we're doing this optimization, then, you know, when it converges, it could converge to a trajectory that looks like this, where, um, you know, we nicely avoid collision and we, we, and we reach one of the targets. But the, the, um, one of the issues with uh, this pinch, uh, pinch point method is that uh, once you kind of satisfy this, reach the target without first uh, entering the failure conditions uh, criteria, then uh, optimi optimization stops, right? Because that's what we fed the algorithm. The algorithm uh, criteria is satisfied. So what it does is that it just has the car drift to the end of our uh, planet horizon. But um, which, you know, could be fine in certain situations, but in certain situations, if our car drifts, like in this one here, then our vehicle could collide into something. And in this case, it's just uh, cones, right? And me and my collaborators kind of really sat down and thought about this and thought about, okay, you know, these this pinch point method is, you know, uh, you know, used in, you know, the dynamic games community for the most part you know, how can we better optimize these trajectories? And then we kind of thought about it and we thought that, oh, hey, you know, uh, we can maybe make this algorithm time consistent. And when you do so, um, you actually get a new trajectory that looks like the following. And um, yeah, so we safely reach our targets without uh, first entering any failure set or, uh, or colliding with any of the vehicles or uh, the cones. Um, Okay, so let me get a bit more into uh, some of the details of this of these ideas. So, really, uh, when I say time consistent, uh, uh, or uh, when I say time consistent, really, what I'm getting at, you can kind of think of time consistency as um, the principle of optimality, right? So we uh, find our optimal strategies. And um, if we start anywhere at any intermediate point in our trajectory, then the optimal strategies that we found are still optimal. Um, whereas with this pinch point idea, it's not. So, um, so okay. So really what I'm getting at is that- Actually, uh, Dennis, sorry, do you mind uh, if we ask questions during the, the lecture? Would you rather us uh, wait till the end, just to clarify? Uh, either or, I'm not sure if, uh, I don't know if I could go over time a little bit, Eugene, if that's fine. But if so, then, yeah, questions are, are fine. You're welcome to go over time, but a lot of people usually drop off right at the deadline. So that's uh, the choice. Sounds good. I'll I wait see. till the end then. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So, um, while, uh, so, you know, basically what I'm getting at here is that uh, while strategies found by the pinch point, this pinch point method, uh, they result in optimal trajectories. Before, um, before the target, but or before the critical time, but after the critical time, uh, they the trajectories become suboptimal, uh, suboptimal, making the time inconsistent. So, in this work, what we did is uh, we for, we formulated a time consistent IOQ scheme that can handle general reach board problems. And uh, yeah, and in later slides, you know, our results will show that uh, uh, that this new algorithm is able to find safer solutions in fewer uh, iterations. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you may be like, okay, Dennis, you know, you've been throwing out these ideas of pinch point and this idea of time consistent, you know, get into a little bit more detail so we can understand. I got you. So, um, with this, uh, so I'll start with the pinch point method since this is, um, uh, it, it nicely kind of, uh, adds on to the time consistent ideas that we're using. So, uh, so here, let's say we're in this environment where, you know, it's a one player case, the black circles are obstacles, the magenta circle is our target, set, right? So uh, let's say that we have some initial strategy that we put in terms of dynamics, we wrote a trajectory out and our trajectory looks like this. And obviously our vehicle can't follow this trajectory because not only will it collide with one obstacle, but it'll collide with both, right? So the big picture here is that, um, also, too, so with this IOQ games or IOQR, what, what you do is a backward pass and you do a forward pass. The backward pass that you do is uh, uh, for you to obtain your feedback to feed forward terms. 
and your forward pass is you uh, you roll it out and you uh, get an updated trajectory, right? So with our backward pass, so the slides that I've talked about uh, or that I was talking uh, about previously were just reachability only or avoidance only. And uh, that was like the max, max over time of our G or the min over time of our L. But in this case, if we're doing a reach avoid game, then in line four, that's we have like a max min of like uh, our G function, which is distance to collision, our L function, which is distance to target, and uh, J uh, sub T plus one, which is our uh, objective function at the, at the previous time, previous time since we're going backwards in time. Uh, and so kind of how I think about this formulation here is that, okay, let's say we're at time step T, then at time step T, really the question I'm, a I'm asking myself is that do I care more about uh, avoiding the obstacle, whatever obstacle that may be at my current time step, time step T, or do I care more about getting closer to the goal? Uh, or do I care about what the previous time step cared about, J uh, sub T plus one? And, uh, and I kind of think about it this way because when we apply our control at time step T, uh, this control isn't affecting where we are at time step T, it's affecting where we will be at time step T plus one. And so if at time step T plus one, if, if time step T plus one wants to get closer to the goal or avoid an obstacle, it's not able to do it with its control. So it passes the information back in order to let the other guys know, hey, okay, I care about moving away from the obstacle and getting closer to the goal and then, you know, uh, do with this information as you will. So that's kind of how I think about this. Um, so uh, here, so when we do our backwards pass for this toy example, let's say that the critical time that comes out here is uh, in our first obstacle and it's the failure margin function, it's the G function. So saying, hey, I want to get, I want to move further away from this obstacle, right? So uh, after we do, uh, after we run this algorithm, we could get an updated trajectory that looks something like this. Um, and if our vehicle follows this trajectory, then we say, then we see that, okay, we're a little bit more out of the obstacle, but yet uh, now we're further away from the target. Um, and if we do this back and pass again to get to critical time for this new trajectory, then we, you know, we may get out that, okay, the L function, our target margin function may come out at this point. Um, and so uh, this is our updated trajectory. And uh, if we do this back and forth pass again, get an updated trajectory, then it may look something like this, right? Now where we see, okay, this trajectory is getting closer to the target, but now it's pushed us more back into the obstacle. And that's one of the downsides to uh, this pinch point method, right? Because with each trajectory iterate, uh, iteration, um, if you only care about this one critical time, it's kind of chattering between wanting to get closer to the target, but pushing us back into the obstacle, or getting further away from the obstacle, but getting us further away from the target. So you kind of get this back and forth between both, um, which is uh, one of the uh, downsides uh, to this. Um, so, okay. our Vehicle follows this updated trajectory, gets something like this. Uh, due to backward pass, critical time may now be back into the obstacle. We get rid of our old trajectory. Now we have this new trajectory. And uh, many, many iterations later, uh, we may actually converge to optimal uh, trajectory, which looks something like this, where if our vehicle follows this, we see that we've reached the target without first entering an obstacle. But, you know, also to keep in mind that uh, once this criteria is satisfied, uh, these vehicles, you know, drift because it will always stop optimizing because the criteria is satisfied that we gave the algorithm, right? And uh, we've seen, we kind of seen a toy example of how that could not be, uh, you know, the best case scenario. So uh, what we did is we kind of came up with uh, a new algorithm, which is uh, this time consistent reach avoid LQ solver. Um, which uh, for this toy example, let's say we're in the same environment. Uh, we still have two obstacles, uh, still have our target. Let's say that we still have the initial trajectory that if we roll it out, we get this, uh, I mean, we have our initial strategy uh, where we roll it out, we get the same initial trajectory. We still run into both obstacles. Okay, Dennis, what's different from this time consistent idea versus the pinch point idea? So the main difference here is that when we do our backward pass, it's not so with the pinch point method um only one critical time came out it could either be um the target uh, margin function or it could be our obstacle margin function uh 
Um, but as we do our backup pass, you know, I never really said that that's the only critical time. I mean, that's the only margin function that comes out when we do our backup pass. There can be multiple margin function that comes out when we do this backward pass, but we only take the, uh, for the pinch point, we only take the first instance when a margin function comes out when we do our backward pass. So we're kind of like, you know what? Well, you know, if there's more margin function that comes out, then we can optimize about all these multiple points. So really what we're getting at here is that instead of having one critical time, here we are having a set of critical times that we're going to optimize about. And uh, by doing this, uh, we it may look something like this. So our updated trajectory for this toy example here could look something uh, as follows, um, where in this case, now we have multiple uh, target margin functions that comes out, and we still have that same failure margin function that came out initially in the previous time. Um, and when we uh, you know do the second order of Taylor expansion about each one of these critical times and then update our trajectory, uh, it could, uh, our updated trajectory could look something like this, where we see that we're starting to move out of the obstacle, but we're also starting to see that we're getting closer to the target as well. So if our vehicle follows this trajectory, um, it looks something like this. Uh, do the backward pass, we get critical times out that looks like this. Uh, get rid of the old trajectory, now we have our new trajectory. And um, yeah, so this is kind of really the idea. And you know, some iterations later, uh, we could converge to the final trajectory that looks something like this. And if our vehicle follows this, then we see we've successfully avoided the obstacle while uh, entering the, uh, the target set. And the main difference here also, too, is that the vehicle actually ends inside of our target instead of just passing the target and just drifting off and, you know, and you know, just drifting off after, after it reaches the target. But this really comes from the fact that at time step capital T at the end of our planet horizon um, in line four, if we put in capital T, then we see that J sub capital T plus one is infinity. And when we do the min between infinity and L, uh, L is never infinity. So L is gonna come out of that. And we see that our objective function at time step capital T is just the max between our distance to collision and our distance to uh, target. And remember, anytime a margin function comes out of our objective function, that's always going to be a critical time. And so really what I'm getting at here is that the end of our trajectory is always going to be a critical time, which is implying that uh, we always care about ending inside of our target and not just uh, passing it and just drifting on somewhere. Um, OK, so these are the main ideas of the pinch point reach avoid LQ solver, time consistent reach avoid LQ solver. Um, I should have. Uh, okay, uh, now I'll kind of actually show how the algorithm runs in a single player case. Um, so here in this environment, uh, so for the pinch point method and time consistent method, they both have the same initial conditions. They, that uh, environment is exactly the same, but the way they optimize it is a bit different. So, um, so as the two schemes iterate, we see that the, uh, the intermediate strategies for the time consistent method attempts to approach to target uh, attempts to uh, safely approach the target throughout the trajectory. Whereas in contrast, the pinch point method, it only attempts to improve the point of closest approach. But uh, once that happens, it performs poorly afterwards, right? And so let me uh, run this back again. And also too, if you look at the pinch point, uh, if you look at the pinch point uh, run, we can kind of see the red dot is where the critical time is. And so we kind of see that the red dot is jumping back and forth, back and forth between the target and the obstacle. And that's kind of the chattering that I was talking about. Uh, that's the that's very different between pinch point and time consistent, where pinch point is optimizing about every critical time that it has. So um, so it's it's a it's a lot more efficient. Um, whereas if you're only optimizing about this critical time, then you know it's many many it takes many many iterations before you actually satisfy this uh this reach avoid criteria uh for the pinch point and you know if we you know as we can see on top uh it takes 276 iterations for a pinch point algorithm to converge whereas with uh the time consistent algorithm it only takes 42 iterations for it to uh safely reach the target without you know uh, uh while avoiding uh failure conditions um Okay, so uh, here, and this is just the final run, the final trajectory. So 
the vehicles follow the final trajectory, then we see that uh, the pinch point algorithm collides with a, a obstacle after after it's reached a target. Whereas with uh, uh, time consistent methods, uh, that's not the case. Uh, it safely approaches the target throughout the whole trajectory. Um, so yeah, so you know, big takeaway, you know. Uh, Time consistent, uh, the time consistent method is a bit more efficient. Pinch point, uh, you know, does well, but it's suboptimal after it's reached the target uh, since it just, uh, since it drifts. Uh, but it satisfies the criteria, so that's what it's called. Um, so here, I know this looks like a big block, but I promise it's not. Um, so what we have here is, uh, so we did 100 random uh, initial conditions for both uh, well, the, the same 100 random initial conditions for both the pinch point uh, algorithm and our and the time consistent reach reward uh, solver. And uh, yeah, so the red trajectories are uh, when the target is reached and it's safe throughout, so it's it never uh, collided with obstacle. The orange trajectories are uh, the target is reached, but then it's, it, it violated some safety uh, uh, or a safety violation. And then the red orange trajectories are um, where the target wasn't reached safely at all. Um, so kind of looking at these two, it's it's an interesting um, uh, figure for both of these because looking at these two, um, you know what I've said about pinch point that after it's reached the target, it drifts, right? Um, and we can see that by observing that uh, there's a lot more orange trajectories for the pinch point algorithm than there are for the time consistent algorithm, right? And we can kind of see that because we know that time, the time consistent algorithm, the end of our trajectory is always critical time. So that's always going to care about ending inside of our target. Whereas with the pinch point method, it doesn't. Um, and we can also see that because our initial state are the red dots and our final state are the blue dots. And for the pinch point method, there's a lot more blue dots that's scattered around in this, uh, in this figure versus the time consistent where there's not that many blue dots uh, scattered around in that. Um, you know, also too, I've, you know, talked about, okay, that time, the time consistent uh, solver actually cares about ending inside of our target set. And you could be like, okay, well, Dennis, where is the target set? Because there's a bunch of stuff going on here. We don't, and we can't see it. Well, one way uh, you kind of sort of can uh, tell where it's at is, uh, is for the time consistent uh out or solver we can see that really a lot of the blue dots are like bunched up in the in between all the obstacles there's like a area where all the blue dots are bunched up and that's exactly where our uh target set is um whereas you know it may not be it may be a little less obvious with the pinch point because all the final states are uh scattered because pinch point doesn't care about ending inside of the target it only cares about reaching the target without first entering the target. Um, okay. So doing a little bit more analysis between both methods. Um, so with these 100 runs, uh, what we did here is that we wanted to compare like apples to apples and not apples to oranges. So one thing we did here is that we, uh, we put the pinch point criteria on the time consistent method. And so really what we're saying is, okay, once for the time consistent solver, we run it up until it reaches the target without first entering the failure step. And once that happens, then we stop the we stop the algorithm. Um, and so when we put the pinch point criteria on the time consistent uh, uh, solver, then uh, with the hundred random uh, with the one hundred runs, we see that ninety three in the first column, or technically second column, we see that ninety three out of the one hundred runs were successful for the pinch point, whereas eighty eight out of the one hundred were successful for the time consistent algorithm. When putting the pinch point criteria on it. Um, and so between the two successful uh, runs, 83, uh, both methods had 83 initial conditions in common. So we just looked at those 83 and we see that in uh, column three that uh, uh, on average, it took uh, like 34 uh, iterations for uh, the pinch point algorithms to converge. Whereas with the time consistent method, on average, it took 19 iterations to converge. And uh, for pinch point, one of the 83 runs took 140 iterations to converge, whereas with time consistent, one of the 83 uh, runs took 77. Um, now we're saying that, okay, it's not, uh, for the last column, we're saying, okay, it's not only good enough to, uh, you know, reach the target without first uh, uh, violating safety constraints, but, you know, let's look throughout the rest of the, the trajectory 
and see if the entire trajectory remains safe instead of just satisfying this reaching the target without first entering the obstacle. And uh, when we look at that, we see that uh, pinch point actually drops by 30. Um, so uh, 93 of them were um, uh, reached the target without first entering the obstacle. But if we look throughout the whole trajectory, we see that uh, only six of them uh, stay safe throughout the entire trajectory. Whereas uh, with time consistent, um, it dropped by 10. So 10 of the trajectories weren't, uh, weren't safe throughout the, uh, weren't safe throughout. Um, but also keep in mind that we're using the pinch point criteria. So if we kind of, cause we, we press the pause button and once it, you know, for the time consistent method, once it reached the target without first entering failure set, we just press the pause for the most part. Some, tra some trajectories may be done optimizing, but some may not. So we're kind of like, okay, what if we hit the play button? How many of these trajectories will actually correct themselves and actually remain safe throughout? Um, uh, throughout? And kind of when we run back the algorithm, we see that six of the trajectories correct themselves. So, uh, so the number goes from 78 uh, remaining safe throughout to 84 when we kind of give back the criteria for the time consistent algorithm. Um, so yeah, so uh, this is kind of comparison between both methods. Um, so now I'll talk about the defensive driving scenario. Um, so, uh, so let's say, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pick on Eugene for just a quick second, if I, uh, if I will. So, you know, let's say, you know, uh, Eugene is going to start at NYU. He's going to, you know, teach a class, um, uh, you know, at some point. And let's say, you know, when he does, you know, um, you know, let's say that he's giving the students, you know, a lot of homework. And, you know, these may be grad students, so they also have, um, you know, they also have research to do. And, you know, let's say that in this case scenario that um, that they also have an exam that same day that they need to turn in this homework. So um, so they could be really stressed. They could be trying to crank out this homework while on the way to school and also studying for the exam Eugene is going to give them. But also, too, you know, it, it may have been a terrible few days with cranking out research, doing the homework, you know, amongst other things. So they stop by their favorite coffee coffee shop to get their get some caffeine in their body. Uh, you know, they may also call mom and dad while they're on the road to let mom and dad know that hey, I'm I'm still alive, I'm still breathing. Um, and you know, let's say you know they get to class and uh, you know turn in the homework and you know take the exam, but the exam was just brutal, right. And so on their way home, you know, they may be dealing with a lot of emotional pain. So on their way home, they may stop by, the, by their favorite beverage store. And, uh, you know, uh, five years later, they may start dosing off behind the wheel. Um, you know, please don't drink and drive. This is just uh, this is just a case. Uh, this is just a uh, fake example that I'm throwing out there. But, um, you know, let's say they temporarily doze off behind the wheel and they encounter some situation like this where they uh, find themselves steering into the oncoming vehicle's lane. But when they kind of wake up quickly, then they uh, grab the steering wheel and, and uh, quickly get back into their life. Right. And uh, really what I'm trying to get at here is that uh, when we start deploying our autonomous vehicles out into the real world, uh, you know, uh, you know, people are sometimes temporarily distracted, whether it be this case scenario, whether it be on their phones, et cetera. But we also want our autonomous vehicles and also the, the other people, the person that's on the other side to uh, remain safe. So, um, so we kind of uh, talked about this and we're kind of thinking like, hey, you know, maybe this time consistent reach avoid, you know, solver could actually, uh, maybe we could demonstrate these ideas on how our autonomous vehicle could uh, remain safe um, using, uh, using the, al uh, the algorithm that uh, I just talked about previously. And that's what we did. So, um, but first I'll get into um, some previous work before I, I talk about our formulation and uh, how it worked. Um, so here, let's say that uh, the gray DeLorean, this is a DeLorean because this is back to the future. Um, let's say that the gray DeLorean uh, is the uh, ego agent. The ego agent is controlling, controlling this gray DeLorean. Uh, and let's say that uh, the ego agent assumes that all other agents that's on the road are temporarily distracted. Um, and so we have this yellow vehicle here, which is uh, the other agents. So. Let's say that this agent it could be Homer Simpson, right? He's a hardworking man. And uh, let's say that, you know, in this GIF here, that uh, 
he temporarily dozes off, but then he wakes up and uh, grabs the steering wheel and gets back into his lane. Um, so for the previous work, they uh, divided the uh, two sub intervals in, into like adversarial phase, which is from zero to T-react. And then T-react is like the switch between uh, behaving adversarially and then kind of waking up and behaving cooperatively and cooperatively in this case is just, okay, not getting into a collision and, you know, um, staying in my lane. Um, so here, uh, T-react could be somewhere, you know, uh, here for the non-ego agent. Um, and so kind of what we have in mind is that uh, when the agent is temporarily extracted and then when it behaves cooperatively, we could have some simulation that looks something like this. This is kind of the big picture that we, we have in mind that we want our autonomous vehicle to do. Um, so uh, the running cost that they did, so the our cost function is divided into two. So if we're anywhere between zero and T-React, then it's G-adversarial. But if it's from T-React to T, then it's G-cooperative. Uh, and our total cost, or the total cost that the previous work did, um, they did a time um, sum over time cost structure. So you add up the adversarial phase, the cost you get in adversarial phase, and you add up the cost that you get in uh, cooperative phase. Um, so some of the key changes that we did from this previous algorithm, and then also to the previous, uh, this previous work used, uh, they did this, but they also used IOQ games. So it, this is just a few, a few changes from IOQ games, but they used the, the, the main flow down from IOQ games uh, with, these, uh, with these things in mind. Um, but for our work, um, the key changes between, uh, you know, what we're going to do versus the previous work is, uh, one, uh, this formulation is a reach avoid game instead of, instead of a time additive game. And also, two, uh, it, here we're going to allow the ego agent to control both vehicles after T-React. And the reason that we're doing so is because if the non-ego agent or the oncoming vehicle, if it knows it's going to behave cooperatively, uh, from um, T-React to the end of our planet horizon, then it may not truly behave adversarially in the, in the uh, adversarial interval. Um, but, you know, if we kind of give control to the ego agent, then it's actually truly able to behave adversarially from zero to T-React. Um, okay, so, yeah, so this allows the non-ego agent to, uh, or the oncoming vehicle to behave truly adversarially. Um, and uh, that's the key changes from previous work to kind of what we're going to do. Um, so, yeah, so for our work, what we're doing, what we did for this problem, so we, each agent uh, has, or both agents have a uh, state vector of such where P, X, P, Y is our position, theta is our heading angle, V is our front wheel angle, V is our speed. Um, and each vehicle's state evolves as uh, bicycle dynamics. Um, okay. So uh, also for here, uh, the Eagle's control input is, it controls only the DeLorean vehicle from zero to T-React, but then the Eagle agent controls both vehicles from T-React to Alpha T, or to the end of our time horizon. Uh, the oncoming vehicle or the non-Eagle agent uh, only has control of its vehicle from zero to T-React, and then otherwise the controller doesn't exist. Okay. so. Uh, the ego's objective is of the form J, which is just the same objective uh, structure that we had uh, when I was talking about the pinch point and time consistent or time consistent uh, algorithms. Uh, written a bit differently, but you know if you kind of do the math, it, it, they're both equivalent. Um, okay, so the failure conditions uh, for the ego agent is uh, we do, we take the max of multiple G functions. Uh, G1 is just a desired separation between both, both vehicles. Uh, G2 is the lane boundary, so wants to stay in this lane. G3 is the lane boundary for the oncoming vehicle because once the ego agent takes control of the oncoming vehicle, then you know for it to remain safe, then you know we may also want it to uh, uh, you know stay in this lane as well. And um, then we have like a max steering angle. Um, boundary where it's just like, okay, to make this more realistic, then the steering angle is between negative 30 and 30. Uh, uh, the target function encodes the sign distance between just the, just the sign distance between where it's at and the uh, target. Um, okay, so for the oncoming vehicle, 
same objective function, uh, the ferry function encodes the max of uh, the distance or the lane boundary uh, for the oncoming vehicle or non eagle agent. Uh, the target function, since it's behaving adversarially, then we're taking the we take the negative of the max between both uh, the distance between both vehicles and uh, the dis uh, the lane boundary for the eagle agent. So really, this is just saying, um, okay, hey. Um, you know, I get rewarded if I uh, make a collision with uh, the ego agent, or if I can push the ego agent, or if I can make the ego agent uh, uh, violate its lane boundary. Okay, so, you know, simulation time. So um, here um, we have two cases. So this time horizon, our planet horizon is three seconds. Uh, so if we have T react uh, is two seconds, I mean, I'm sorry, if T react is one second and if we kind of crank up the knob, then kind of intuitively we kind of we kind of know what to expect if T react is small, but if we kind of crank it up, which is just giving the vehicle more time to behave adversarially. Uh, but let's see if you know uh running this uh time consistent uh LQ solver actually uh does what we intuitively think it should do. So when T react is small, uh when it's one second, uh we see that the vehicle is able to successfully avoid collision. Um, but as we kind of crank up the knob and when we crank it up to where T react is two seconds, then we see that um, uh, collision is unavoidable. There's uh, uh, nothing the autonomous vehicle, which is the white DeLorean in this case, can do to actually avoid collision. Um, and then here, uh, I'm just depicting the closest point between uh, both vehicles. So when T react is one, uh, the closest point between both is this. But as we kind of crank up the knob, then uh, this is the unavoidable case. So, you know, we clearly see that both uh, vehicles collide. Um, okay. Um, and then this is just a convex hull of both cases. Uh, so this is just like our initial trajectory and then the final trajectory. And this, so this is kind of like a trajectory sweep, if you will. Um, and we see that uh, for T-React is small, we kind of have a small hump. But as we kind of crank up T-React, uh, we see that the hump becomes bigger and it gets more and more into the autonomous vehicle's lane, which is the white one. Okay. Uh, last but not least, I won't take up much more of the time, but uh, this is a three-player case. So here we have um, uh, three players, two vehicles, and a uh, pedestrian. The pedestrian is the blue trajectory. We just didn't put an uh, image in there on accident. Uh, the only difference between both cases is that the autonomous vehicle has an initial heading angle uh, on the left side of power over two, whereas on the right side, it has an initial heading angle of power over two plus power over eight. Um, so here, I'll just show the trajectory optimization uh, of both algorithms. Okay. And uh, so even with this small change in uh, initial heading angle of the, the autonomous vehicle or the DeLorean, uh, actually, different behaviors uh, come out of uh, each. So on the left, uh, we'll see that uh, uh, the red car yields to the uh, northbound vehicle or the autonomous vehicle before it makes uh, it makes this left turn. Uh, whereas on the right, it actually cuts in front of it and forces the autonomous vehicle to swerve uh, to avoid collision. And I'll uh, sh I'll run these one more time. Uh, so that's uh, when the heading angle is power over two for the autonomous vehicle. And then when it's power over two plus power over eight, then we get a uh, very different behavior. Um, okay, so, uh, and this is the convex hull. This is the trajectory sweep of both cases uh, for the three player case. And uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, if, uh, if there's any takeaway from this talk, really, you know, what I wanna say is that, um, uh, Reach Boy Games provide a natural framework for safe autonomy and multi-agent interactions. And uh, in our work, we uh, develop a time-consistent Reach Boy solution scheme that finds uh, more efficient uh, solutions uh, than the state-of-the-art method, which the state-of-the-art method that's been used is this pinch point. Um, so with this, um, I won't get into the future work because I, I know you know uh, a bit over time, but um, but I'll just say. Uh, you know, uh, thank you all for listening, and thanks, thanks for those who stayed behind. And uh, I'll, I'll take any questions. Thanks so much for the talk, Dennis. Um, yeah, if anybody has a like a final question before they head out.
Um, and I see people have to run. Um, I also, unfortunately, have to run. But thank you so much for the talk. And uh, you know, congratulations on, on your graduation. Thank you so much.